o giga. life he has in store for us. We're in, I don't even know what number now, of get up and go. Uh, we're talking about ways we can practically apply Scripture and the Word of God and his relation, the relationship we have with him to our lives. It's been really cool to see all the different applications and all the different things we've talked about over the last few weeks uh, and even months at this point. But we're going to be coming to a close here pretty soon as school's about to kick back up. Summer is sadly coming to an end eventually, and then, yeah, we'll be back to fall, but fall brings some good stuff too. Today, we're going to be talking about something that I think in America, and our culture, we don't give as much thought to, maybe as we should. It's something that we all know about, and we keep it as part of our faith, but it's not necessarily a huge part of our faith. It's not as big as it has been for Christians in the past. I don't think it's quite as big as it is for Christians around the world. It might be because we feel like we have more control over our lives, the, the wealth and prosperity we experience. It allows us to feel like we have this amount of control and that we can take care of ourselves when really we still need God. But today we're going to talk about that, and I hope that this encourages you to follow the passage we're talking about today. The passage we're talking about today is pretty darn short. It's pretty easy. If you like to memorize verses, this is a great one to memorize because it's either two or three words long, depending on which translation you're using. Uh, we are today in the book of Thessalonians, and it is a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica, I have been told is the name. It's kind of funny that they had such a long name for something when uh, writing was so expensive, but I guess they felt it was really important to get the, all the extra letters in there. When Paul wrote this letter, he was, these people, the church that he had formed, it was a church he was really proud of, people who followed God deeply and truly. It wasn't a huge church, but it was a committed and devoted church to God. And they had some theological questions for Paul. So he wrote them back, and he answered them. He was like, these are good questions, and here's some answers that I have for you. And then we're going to pick up at the very end of the book, at the very end of the letter that Paul wrote, he gives a couple quick little tidbits. He's like, hey, you guys are doing great. But he throws out things like, you know, always keep following God. Don't let your, your thirst for him be quenched. You know, be, be thankful, be joyous, be happy, celebrate in the life that you have. And then in verse 17, he throws in a little, just super short command. He says, pray continually. Some translations say pray without ceasing, pray without stopping, pray unceasingly, but they all mean pretty much the same thing, which is that we should always be praying. And I don't know about you, but I'm not praying 24-7. I'm not sure he means us to take this literally, but if he's not, it leaves the question, what is it that he means? What does he mean by this? And when I told a friend that I was going to be preaching on this passage this week, she told me a story of how when she was in middle school, she heard this. And she was Catholic, so she tends to take things a little bit literally sometimes. And so she was like, what I did every morning when I woke up is I would say, dear God. Then right before I went to bed, I would say amen. So the whole day was covered in prayer. It's all taken care of. Don't need to worry about it. Pray continually. Got it. Then she said there was the one issue, though, is sometimes she couldn't fall asleep. So she'd say amen, but then instead of falling asleep right away, it's like, you know, there's that gray period where it's like she's not praying anymore, but she's still awake. What's going to happen? She's not praying continually. Uh, thankfully, she said in high school, she learned that this means something a little bit different from that. But if it's not literal, what does it mean? 
What does Paul mean when he wrote to the people of Thessalonica and he said, pray continually, never stop? Well, one thing that Paul is referring to is frequency. It's how often we should be praying. And when I think about how often we should be praying, I like to go back to Jesus because I feel like he's a pretty good example of how we should be trying to live parts of our lives. I know we can't do miracles. At least I can't. If any of you can, please step up. I bet you could do a better job with this. But we can't all do miracles. We're not all the, uh, you know, the savior of the world. But I think we can take some pieces of Jesus' life and apply them to our own or at least learn from them. And one of them is how Jesus prayed. When I looked up, I, I just, you know, I'm young, I'm a millennial. I just did a Google search and I said, yeah, how many, uh, how much did uh, Jesus pray? I just Googled Jesus praying. The amount of verses that I got was stupendous. There were a bunch of verses, and I just have a couple quick ones for you today. Starting off in Mark chapter 1, verse 35, it says, It was very early in the morning and still dark. Jesus got up and left the house. He went to a place where he could be alone. There he prayed. In Luke chapter 5, verse 16, it says, But Jesus often went away to be by himself and pray. In Luke chapter 6, verse 12, on one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray. He spent the whole night praying to God. We've got John chapter 17. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed. And then it's a whole chapter of Jesus prays for himself. Then he prays for his disciples who are with him. Then he prays for all of the followers of Christ. Then we've got Luke chapter 9, verses 18 and 28. 18 says, one day Jesus was praying alone. Only his disciples were with him. And then 28 says, about eight days after Jesus said this, because there's a little bit preceding it, he went up to a mountainside to pray. He took Peter, John, and James with him. When we look at when Jesus prayed, he prayed at all times of the day. He prayed in the morning. He prayed at night. He prayed during the day. He prayed during his ministry. When we look at what situations Jesus was praying in, he would go alone, be just totally by himself, and he would pray to God. Sometimes he would pray with just a few close friends when he took Peter, James, and John. Sometimes it was for all of his disciples. Sometimes it was for all of the crowds following him. Jesus prayed everywhere, every time, and in every situation. So when we're talking about frequency, we're talking a lot we're talking often. But that might be a little bit difficult because when it comes to trying to be disciplined in something or when it comes to, comes to trying to achieve something, it can be hard to just keep reminding yourself to do it all the time. It's like, oh man, I gotta pray now. I gotta pray now. I gotta pray now. And that's also not really the goal here because Jesus wasn't on like a prayer schedule. You know how everybody has kind of like a workout routine Sometimes the routine is no routine. I think that's the best routine. But whatever, you know, everyone's got like a little workout routine. It's a workout schedule. But the healthiest people often don't really necessarily have a schedule. They just love to be out doing stuff. They just love to be out going for it, having fun and being active. See, Jesus didn't have some prayer schedule. He was like, oh, need to go pray now. Need to go pray now. Need to go pray now. Prayer for him was a lifestyle. It was a piece of who he is. It was as, as important to him as eating. In some cases, it was more important than sleeping. I don't know about you, but no matter what the routine is, I always include sleep because I like to sleep a lot. It's nice. I also always include food because I like to make sure I get well fed. These things aren't really a routine. They're just what we do as people. And that's what prayer was like for Jesus. It was part of who he was. It wasn't something where he had a list of how often he needed to do it or he was like, okay, I took, you know, I checked off this prayer muscle. Time to move to this prayer muscle group. Then I'll do some prayer stretching. It wasn't like that. He just would go and pray because it was so, so important. You know, I, I love to see uh, sometimes, you know, professional athletes, especially this happens to a lot of football players, they'll retire and 
they've been at this peak physical performance for so long. They've done it for years. They've worked so hard. And then you see they kind of go in a couple different ways. Some of those guys, like I remember reading about this offensive lineman. He was this big 300-something pound guy. He was huge. He was known for how strong he was. And then he retired, and a year later, I saw a picture of him after he ran a marathon. He looked like he was a buck 70. Like, it was crazy. But for him, like, being healthy and active was just a lifestyle. Like, yeah, he'd come up with things to train for, like, but, you know, staying healthy and playing football, that, yeah, it was part of his job, but he just wanted to be working out and working hard and being active. Then you'll see other guys. <laughs> I remember seeing one, one time there was a season of, like, The Biggest Loser, and there were these two former Alabama offensive linemen, you know? And it's because in college it was like, never stop eating. You know, they're constantly just like, oh, hey, you just had lunch? Yeah, you're at class? Yeah, eat a snack, please. How much are you? Oh, I hit 320 today. Okay, let's get to 325 because those guys, they got to be big. And these guys, once they, you know, stopped with their football career, they were like, oh, you just got to keep eating, I guess. But they didn't work out as much. <laughs> and that doesn't go too hot. <laughs> and so you see with, with, you know, former athletes, how for some of them that being healthy and being active is a lifestyle. It's just part of who they are. And so even after they retire, they're good. But some guys, it's like when they're playing football, when they're going for it, they're like, yeah, I got to work out. I got to be strong. But as soon as that's gone, they stop. So what is prayer for you? It's like, oh man, I got to, got to be a good Christian. Got to follow God. So I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray when I can. It's going to be like a disciplined thing. Maybe you pray before every meal or you pray before dinner. Maybe you pray every night or something. But it's like, okay, I've got to get this prayer done. That's good. The point of prayer is not to pray. It's beyond that. The point of prayer is to know God. The point of prayer is to communicate with our Father. That's what Jesus did. Jesus did not have boxes to check for prayer. He didn't pray because he was like, man, I need to be a good savior. It'll look really bad if people are reading the book of John and they don't see Jesus prayed enough. So I need to make sure I get that checked off. That's not what he was praying for. He was praying for sustenance. He was praying because it was important to him because he loved it and he wanted to do it. Not because he felt like he had to, not because he felt like it was part of like, okay, well, I'm in this situation, so I need to. It was because it was part of who he was. So when Paul says to pray continually, and we want to follow that, I would challenge you to look at your view of prayer. Now look, if you need to be disciplined, like I know this for me, like when I'm first trying to form a habit or you're trying to make a lifestyle change, sometimes you need a little bit of discipline. Sometimes you need to check those boxes. Sometimes you need to start that way. But it shouldn't ever stay that way. It should be something that develops into something that you love and that matters. And this is the second part of prayer that I want to talk about today. Prayer is not just talking. Prayer is not just like, okay, well, I need to tell God about how my day was. I need to ask him for a couple things. I need to make sure I get some forgiveness up in here because, oh boy, it's been a rough day. That's not what prayer really is. In Matthew chapter 6, when Jesus is giving the Sermon on the Mount, he takes a second to talk about prayer. And he says, don't babble on endlessly as the pagans do. They think they'll be heard because of their many words. Prayer is not about getting up and just talking a bunch to God. Prayer is so much deeper and more important than that. And this is the second part that's important when it comes to praying continually. Because if somebody wants to get in shape and they're like, man, I'm going to go to the Y every day. And they go every day and they get there and they're like, yeah, I got here. Going to go uh, sit on the elliptical. I'm not really going to pedal, but they've got that nice TV screen. They're not going to get in very good shape. And prayer is the same way. Even if we pray continually, if we're not truly praying, opening ourselves up to God, then really what is it worth? Then we're just babbling him endlessly, thinking we will be heard because of our many words. So what is real prayer? What does it mean to truly, truly pray to God? Well, there's a couple signs that can really help you know that you are truly praying to the God who created the universe. The first step is you have to look at where you are spiritually and mentally. 
and physically to a point, but focus on the spiritual and the mental aspect. It's an intentional thing. When we're hanging out with our friends or having like a deep, real conversation with somebody, we're not multitasking. Now, yeah, when we're just hanging out or having a good time, we'll pull out our phone, maybe we're doing something else. But when we're having those true, real conversations, we're not going to be multitasking. We're focused. And that's how prayer is. Focus on God. Be intentional to have your mind right mentally and your spirit right and ready to receive him and his truth. When we were doing the pod, we do a podcast, uh, Dr. Peak does one called The Salty Pastor. And I was on it on Tuesday since I'm preaching this week. And we talked a little bit about it, about prayer. And Dr. Peak asked me, he said, does your mind need to be engaged to be praying? And because I'm a millennial, I said, kind of. I'm like, I don't want to say yes. I don't want to say no. I want to say kind of. The reason I say kind of is I don't want you to get this idea that prayer is just about like constantly thinking of all these things and thinking of what you want to say and thinking about what you want to talk about and thinking about, oh, I need to talk about this and this and this. So you, your mind doesn't need to be engaged like really like thinking about something like a math problem, but it does need to be focused on God. So that's the first part, is focus when you pray. Make sure your focus and your attention is on God. But the second part is something that I think is not understood well about prayer. And that is that prayer is not just talking, and it's not just focused talking. It's not just focusing on God and then being really, really, you know, zoned in on Him and then saying things. Prayer involves listening. It involves learning, it involves waiting, it involves interceding, it involves supplication, it involves being thankful, and yeah, it involves requests too. Prayer is so diverse and deep. There are so many different ways to pray and so many different things that can involve prayer. And so often, we get it set into this track of, can talk to God, tell him how my day was, you know, see how everything's going, maybe ask for a few things, maybe do some prayer requests, and then say amen. But prayer is so, so, so much more than that. One thing that prayer involves is meditation. Now, that might be kind of weird to hear, because usually when you think of meditation, you think of, you know, some monk probably, in, you know, in the mountains in Asia, cross-legged, going om or something like that. Like, that's kind of the American view of meditation, isn't it? It's like some Eastern practice, and, and it is. They practice it over there a lot. But there is a key difference between their meditation and what true Christian meditation is. Because true Christian meditation, and even Jewish meditation, goes back to the Old Testament. In the book of Joshua, Joshua, when he is given command of the Israelites, is told to meditate on the Torah night and day. He's not just told to read it, he's told to meditate on it. See, in, in the East, meditation, whether it be for Buddhism or Hinduism or, or any of those religions or philosophies, it's about emptying yourself. It's about letting go of everything, letting go of your desires, letting go of your stressors, letting go of your anxiety or your schedule, your, your thoughts, your busy day. It's about being completely empty and still. And that's a great start. But the problem is they finish there. Christian meditation is about doing all those same things. It's about emptying yourself. But Jesus tells a parable of a house that has an evil spirit in it. And the house is cleansed of this evil spirit, and it's empty. But if nothing fills the house, he says, that evil spirit will gather up its friends, move back into the house, and the house will be worse off than before. Christian meditation, we start by emptying ourselves, but then we desire to be filled with God. We desire for his love and his peace, his kindness and his power, his mercy and justice to fill our lives. That's part of prayer. That's how we learn from God. 
That's how he changes us, is when we are open and vulnerable and we allow him to come into our lives. One of the most powerful things this can lead to is understanding God's perspective on things. There was a, there was a Christian apologist who passed recently who was very popular, and, and I listened to him tell this story one time. He said uh, there was this, this man, he was a farmer, and one day his horse ran away. And so his neighbor came up to him and said, oh, that's the worst of luck. Maybe you did something wrong. You know, the gods are upset with you. A couple days later, the horse actually came back. But because it had been in the wild, some other wild horses started following it. So now we had more horses than before. And his neighbor came up and said, wow, you're a blessed man. You just got all these free horses. So the farmer's like, this is great. So he's, he starts breaking them in and taming them. His son is taming them too. And one day, his son is trying to tame one of these wild horses and it bucks, throws his son off, and his son breaks his arm. His neighbor comes up, oh man, you must be cursed. The gods must be upset with you. Your son is injured now. He can't work for weeks. A few days later, an army came through looking for conscripts forcing the young men of the village to join them. Then they saw the farmer's son and said, oh, he's, he's got a broken arm. He can't help us. So they left him there. The neighbor came up. You must be blessed by the gods. Oh, wow, what a stroke of luck. So often in our lives, we can't see beyond where we're at. And that's okay. We're humans. God created us. We experience time. We experience causes and effects and all these things, and we can't see. We don't know what's coming. We don't know all the things that are going to happen in the future. But we do know somebody who does. And when we pray, we can hear his perspective on these things. One of the most powerful things that can happen when you pray, one of the most powerful things that can happen when you wait and you listen and you are still, when you meditate on God's scripture, when you pray to him and ask him about what's happening in this world or in your life or in the lives of others, is you can hear and see and learn his perspective on them. God is right. God is true. God is good. And his perspective on the things of this world, in some cases, is radically different than ours. He knows all. He knows what's coming. He knows what's going to happen. He knows what his plan is. And as humans, we can't just see and know his plan. We don't know it. But we can talk to him. We can listen to him. We can read his scripture and meditate on it. And then, we may not know all of it, but there's a reason that in one of his letters, Paul talks about peace beyond understanding. Maybe we won't even understand what's going on. Maybe we won't fully grasp or comprehend all the things God is doing, but he can offer us peace in times of hardship, in times of strife, maybe in times of blessing. He can offer us perspective on the fact that, yes, he's blessed us, but it's not everything. He is. James chapter 1, verse 5 says to pray for wisdom. If any of you is seeking wisdom, pray for it. And God, who is generous, will bless you with it. Prayer is designed for us to know God and be changed by him. The goal of praying is not to pray. It's to know God. Jesus prayed frequently because it was important to him, because it was part of his spiritual sustenance. Do we treat prayer that way? Or do we treat it as something that, oh, it's night, I'm about to go to bed, I should say a quick prayer. Or, oh, God told me to pray, so I should do it. When you pray, how do you pray? Does it involve times of quiet? Are some of your prayers really short and some of them really long? Or are they all about the same? Remember that prayer is convening with God. 
So it will be diverse. Sometimes you'll talk a lot. Sometimes you won't say much. Sometimes it'll actually be really quick. There's been times, the funniest for me is what I'll like, I forget what it was, but I had some question that I was struggling with. So I, I set aside some time, like a decent amount of time to pray. And, and I went into the, a place in my house that I really enjoy praying and it, I can make it dark. And I was just ready to like spend a long time struggling with this question. I went in, I sat down, I got ready to pray and then boom. It's like, God, I had a lot more time planned out. It's like, no, you're good. Here it is. It's like, okay. Sometimes it'll be really short. Other times it'll be really long. It's diverse. It's different. It's custom. It's amazing. Think about all the scriptures we read about Jesus. Sometimes he would just say a quick prayer and somebody would be healed. Other times he would travel to a mountain to pray, either alone or with people. One, he prayed through an entire night. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed. Prayer is unique and different every time we do it. So don't treat it like a religious thing. Don't treat it like a ceremony. Don't treat it like something that you need to do or check off. But be involved in it. Be vulnerable with it. So what does Paul say, what does Paul mean when he says to pray unceasingly? Make it a lifestyle. Make it part of your spiritual sustenance from God. And how can we do that? Like I said at the beginning, sometimes we need a little bit of discipline in the beginning. Sometimes we've got to make ourselves do things. Sometimes we've got to start with the checklist until we get used to it and learn how wonderful something really is. So if you're looking for things that you can do, one awesome thing would be to pray with people who are close to you. What if every day you prayed with your spouse or you prayed with your kids? Maybe you pray with your roommate, maybe some of your friends, but you set a time and you intentionally do it. And maybe at first it'll be difficult. Maybe at first it'll feel like a chore. But if you are vulnerable with God, if you intentionally take time to listen to him, to talk to him, to learn from him, to work with him, it will become wonderful eventually. Maybe something that could help you if you get really busy is to set a few alarms for, for throughout the day, just at different times, and just when they go off, be like, I need to pray. It doesn't have to be really long. It doesn't have to be like some super amazing, deep, intense prayer. Like I'm sure we've all heard when people do those and we're like, wow, I can't pray like that. It doesn't need to be that. It could just be a quick short couple minutes, maybe 30 seconds. But taking time to remember God, to remember who he is and to talk with him just really fast. Or maybe as part of your small group, you meet up once a week. And you say, you know what? As a small group, we're going to practice prayer every time we meet up. Or maybe even form a group for prayer. To pray for others, to pray for your families. There are so many ways to get started, and that's the beauty of it. Remember, we have a relationship with God. We're not following some religious creeds. We're not following some rituals or ceremonies. We're trying to get to know him. And the point of prayer is to know him. So any way that brings us to that, that helps us see that and find that, is going to be great. So whatever it may be, whether it be one of those suggestions or be anything else, I would challenge you to try to make prayer part of your lifestyle. It's not something you do, but it's part of who you are. Let's let the host close us out. Your prayer life is necessary for your faith, and it can be so powerful. If you'd like to grow in your prayer life, please text FH Next Step to 97000 so we can join you on our knees in prayer. For those at home, please take some time to consider what you have heard today by reviewing the discussion questions. If you are on campus, please stand for a closing blessing.